discussion, we are fully aligned with everything that has been discussed until now. Um, and I think we are uh, another group of people that are very enthusiastic about using uh, vernacular architecture principles and uh, uh, natural materials to, to construction. And uh, I, we are absolutely convinced that these will be uh, the future for, for uh, our planet, um, mainly when we think about all these regions like African region, which is undergoing a very strong development stage, very, uh, very positive and with a lot of uh, expect expectations. So um, I will not delay anymore this presentation. Uh, we all know already, sorry, it's not sharing. Okay. We all know already that um, population is growing very fast and that we have the highest growing rates here in Africa. Uh, this is very interesting because uh, we are all uh, very much looking forward to, to see what the future holds for, for Africa in general. Uh, of course, this brings a lot of challenges. Um, the growth rate is quite high at the level of the cities or urban populations. So there is a big uh, challenge to urbanization in general uh, to Africa, as we already discussed in the previous uh, presentations. Uh, at the city level, we are uh, watching all these new cities uh, with uh, population over 250,000. And uh, these new cities are, well, facing all these challenges in terms of infrastructures to, to provide the services that the population is, is willing for. Um, and this is creating challenges or creating some risks. Uh, at risk cities are these that are growing at the pace of more than 4%. These high growth rates for the cities are, are, are a challenge. The vast majority of, of future city population growth is, as we all know, also projected to sub-Saharan Africa, to the Middle East and to South and East Asia. Uh, Again, just three countries in the world, uh, China, India, and Nigeria, they represent three uh, big regions, will account for 40% of glo global growth of the population over the next decade. Uh, and that we already discussed, uh, we know that we are moving very fast to uh, urban world population. We had about 3% of world's population living in cities in the early 80s, and now uh, we have 50% and we know this, this percentage is growing fast. So uh, there is this uh, fragility concept that occurs uh, or comes when we think about these cities that are undergoing very high uh, population uh, growth rates, uh, which are considered as cities that are unable or unwilling, this is not the case, most of the cases, but it's also possible, unable to provide or deliver the basic services to the citizens. And this is the, the challenge that, that uh, most of the times has to be faced. Uh, this uh, concept of city fragility that uh, highlights some cases in Africa uh, accounts for population growth, for income inequality, for unemployment rates, for homicide rates, uh, terrorist related ki uh, killings. And, and just to notice, this is not only, uh, this is a general problem, it's not, not um, specific to, to Africa. Um, percentage of press releases related to conflicts, electricity access, air pollution, flood risk, earthquake and cyclone. So these are the, the indicators that are used to calculate this city fragility index. And in, in all of those, uh, maybe the, one that's, the ones that more, uh, more interest Africa are population growth and uh, perhaps uh, resources accessibility. Um, so this is the big challenge and we know that while people are moving to the cities because they, uh, they want to have access to connectivity, to the uh, network, the world network, to uh, uh, services, to jobs, uh, to uh, social contacts, uh, this is a normal trend. Uh, cities, as we know, they are uh, very resource insensitive, although they are very, uh, um, they are very, efficient on the use of these resources, 
they use, uh, although they produce also 80% of the global G GDP in, in, in cities, they also consume 60 to 80% of the global energy. Uh, they generate 75% of carbon emissions and consume more than 75% of the world's natural resources. Uh, this brings us to the big discussion, how should we look at the old development models, how the old cities have developed, how the infrastructures were created, uh, how all these resources uh, were helping to create all these cities and how should we do it in the future or how future generations will think about this, this, uh, this evolution that is still very resource intensive because all this has to be created. So the question is, um, maybe we can answer it and maybe the future generations with their creativity, with all this wealth uh, of knowledge that we have been watching, all this uh, natural will to learn and to be um, connected to nature will be uh, tending to use more the construction materials that they can find locally. Uh, also to use processes that include social involvement. So they take advantage of local skills, they create local jobs and eventually businesses or occupations for people. They favor locally available skills and resources. They mobilize communities and build local capacity. Uh, reduce, this is very important, the flows of resources that are very demanding and basically preserve their culture, their, their built, er, built heritage and all the accumulated knowledge that belonged to their old generations. Is this viable? This is the question and perhaps this is our um, example that we bring here and along with all the discussions that other colleagues have mentioned. Earth construction is a good example because it is um, based on the use of raw, raw earth as the main construction material. It is a long lasting experience from humankind. Uh, it, uses, it uses a huge collective knowledge. Um, so there is a lot of experience already. And still during these days, about one fifth to one third of the world population still uses and uh, is widely disseminated the cons this type of construction for living, for housing and for other type of buildings and 50% in developing regions. There are several examples of enduring structures uh, made of earth. 10% uh, of world UNESCO World Heritage is built with earth. Uh, they also have some uh, pathologies that we should consider but these examples are pretty nice showing us that there are no not so many limitations. There were no limitations in the past and probably with the technology we have today, we can do much better. Also, uh, if we consider high uh, rise construction at the scale that we can think about using earth, there are also examples. So there were no uh, technical limitations in the past. In, this may uh, make us think about if there should be limitations during these days. Also in Africa, very nice examples of uh, vernacular architecture, uh, earth construction and applications of such a wandering system. The main advantages, I think they are very well known for all the speakers here. They are uh, based on a low cost material, a local earth. They uh, in, are low embodied in terms of energy. So they are not energy intensive. They uh, impose a low or a reduced environmental impact. They are somewhat fire resistant and this is maybe the best aspect that is um, uh, driving the attention from many architects nowadays, even well in, in Portugal and in other countries. It has a different feeling if you are inside of this type of constructions, thermal and acoustic behavior, they are very different and they give you a, a special feeling. So it, this is uh, searched by many people nowadays. And there is also the optimal control of indoor humidity. Some disadvantages also, and these are well known because at some point they have been 
delaying the evolution of this technique or, or maybe the resurgence of these, these techniques, lower mechanical and structural performance in comparison with other conventional materials, high vulnerability to earthquakes and rain. And this is uh, particularly important to our research group. We do a lot of work at this respect. More maintenance is needed because we have to take care of, of, of the structure or of these materials. And uh, until now, there is still some lack of proper regulation or some technical guidelines that can be used to uh, normalize and to, uh, to assure some, some level of safety. Uh, sometimes, because this is not a technique that can be used everywhere, at least with local materials, the soils are not adequate and they need to be transported from uh, uh, larger distances and uh, to be adapted to local conditions. Okay, so now I will uh, give the stage to my colleague, to Tiago Miranda. He will continue. Tiago, thank you. Okay, um, let me just share my screen. Okay. So greetings from Portugal to everyone who's watching us around the world, uh, a special warm um, greeting to our friends in Africa. Um, I will start this part with the, a contextualization of the some of, of the earth construction techniques. There are several techniques uh, that have been applied uh, through the centuries. Uh, first one I'm showing here are the adult um, is the adopt technique, which is composed by, by uh, earth bricks that are molded by hand, clay bricks that are molded by hand. Uh, the other one is the ramp earth technique, in which the soil is compacted in, um, in a form, directly building walls with, this, with the soil. And uh, the compressed, compressed earth blocks, in which the, the soil is molded into bricks in a, normally manually in a, in a, in a machine that, that uh, does this, this part of the work. Um, and the question is, is uh, uh, not, not, not uh, uh, every soil is, is uh, suitable for the earth, earth construction. Uh, it has to um, comply with certain uh, characteristics uh, mainly uh, in relation with the particle size di distribution. You can see here in these plots uh, for ram earth and for compact earth block blocks, the, um, the particle size distribution must be within the gray zones. Uh, so it has to have a smooth distribution uh, to have uh, different size of, of, um, of, of particles. And also very important is the clay content. It must have uh, a minimum cl clay content that, well, it depends on the technique, but I can say more or less between 15, 20, 25%, it will be ideal for, for the soil. So when you don't have these kind of characteristics in the soil, uh, you have to correct the soil in order to, to, to make it suitable for the uh, earth construction. And that, that is one of the problems that you, we have to face when using this kind of technique. Um, there are several ways to, to improve the soil, to correct the soil in order to make it suitable. Uh, one of the most used techniques is the chemical stabilization. So in sandy soils where uh, you have a lack of clay, normally you add a percentage of cement. In clay soil, in clay soils, normally it's lime that you have, so you, you, control, you can control plasticity, expansion, and other uh, conditions that are not so favorable to, to, to the construction. And in mixed soil, well, you can, in mixed soils that have clay and, and, and sand, you can have a, a little bit of both. So typically, the, the, you, you, can, you must add something between 2.5% and 10% of, of a binder so that you can improve the, the characteristics. Uh, 
of the uh, of the soil so that is uh, it can be um, suitable for for uh, uh, soil, uh, earth construction. I saw previously during the presentation of Professor Henry that someone asked if uh, the um, alkali activation uh, geopolymer could be used in this kind of techniques to to um, substitute the the chemical stabilization using cement, for instance. Uh, for those who are not aware, this is a um, um, another technique that can be used uh, that uh, uh, to improve the soils that replace the use of cement. Okay, normally you use a, a, um, a waste, for instance, uh, fly ash or furnace slags or something like that, that goes through a process of activation uh, that turns that, that waste into a binder. And that, that has many advantages because you will not use cement, which is a raw material with a high embodied energy, and you replace it by a waste that can be transformed um, transformed into a binder. And uh, the answer to the question of if uh, uh, it is possible to use is yes. We, we already used it in, uh, in our research and we showed that it is possible to use uh, wastes to um, substitute the, the, the cement in some kinds of soils and maintaining, the, the, maintaining or even improving the characteristics when comparing with these uh, more uh, used uh, stabilization techniques like, like cement. So also you can use, you can mix the soil with the natural or artificial fibers to induce a more, uh, um, a more uh, uh, flexibility, more flexibility, more resistance to the material, um, uh, uh, improving uh, such characteristics also. So the question is uh, how to bring this material, how to bring this structural, st structural uh, uh, approach to the 21st sec century um, demands. Uh, the answer is that we must tackle some of the drawbacks that Eduardo already presented uh, before. So there, there are some issues and uh, limitations of this kind of material and, and, uh, and structures that must be tackled in order that the, the structural and, and, and functional demands of, of modern construction construct, constructions uh, is also uh, respected using this kind of uh, more natural material. So we have to put uh, technology, science, uh, engineering in, the, in this. We have to make more studies. We have to make to analyze more deeply the properties of this of this kind of of materials, so that we we are more assured, we are more aware and and and, and uh, comfortable on designing using these kind of materials. And uh, we have been working on this on this topic. Uh, for instance, uh, the analysis of the mechanical behavior of this kind of of. Of, of materials in this, you can see on the left hand side, uh, mechanic compression mechanical tests on, on blocks and in, on walls. Uh, in the middle, tension tests, and, the, and in the right hand side, uh, shear tests on, on um, ramp earth um, uh, samples. Um, you can use the, the most advanced techniques that there are for mechanical um, analysis. You can see on the right side um, the application of, of digital image correlation to the analysis of shear uh, tests. Uh, we can see the development of uh, the cracking in the um, in the in the in the samples. Uh, the difference the differences between these two uh, walls were the the the, 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 the the particle size distribution of the soil that was used and the, the compaction levels that uh, make the, the response different in, in both cases. So, uh, but the main idea is it's, it's possible to use the more advanced te lab techniques to characterize the material, uh, material behavior. This is a, a, a picture of a project that we developed for the Malawian, Malawian uh, government uh, that asked us to um, improve the way 
that the earth construction was carried out in the country. And so we developed a, a formulation for, for the material that to, could be used for the, the uh, compressed earth blocks uh, with the, the soil that was used uh, in Malawi. And we developed many studies. We also did a, a shaking table test to, to assess the seismic, seismic performance. And in the end, we uh, established a, a book, a manual, a very interactive um, manual to, uh, with the, the main guidelines to how to construct these houses using, using soil of the um, uh, uh, local soil and uh, uh, local um, uh, labor power. Also, it is possible to see that uh, the durability performance and uh, the functional performance, it's also uh, possible to assess in the laboratory. Um, uh, you can see here uh, some tests for du durability in, in the bottom side and, and the right side. You can see also tests for the uh, uh, acoustic and the thermal uh, properties. Um, this, uh, this is a, a very good example of uh, um, uh, these bricks are made of soil improved with fly ash, which was uh, alkali activated. In, in terms of performance evaluation, we can also make in situ uh, seismic tests to, to, to assess the, uh, the, the performance of, of the structures. This is a real test we did in a house that was built in Portugal, in the, in the north part of Portugal, so to, to, to assess the, the, this, this performance in terms of uh, seismic behavior. We can also develop numerical modeling once we have the properties that we uh, assessed in the laboratory. Um, so that we have a very good insight about the behavior of uh, the material. And uh, for the future, what we need um, is to develop uh, technical guides and normalization. There are uh, already a, a number of uh, international institutes to, that are that are uh, working on this subject. Um, and in the uh, next years, we will have probably uh, some kind of technical guidance uh, that we can use to design these kind of structures and uh, in a, in a more uh, profound way, more secure way. Uh, and uh, and we have more. We can could have more confidence on on the design that we develop. Also, uh, the modern modernization of the construction processes will be uh, of paramount importance on the future, so that we can have more reliability on the on the um, uh, on the final result results that we can uh, obtain. Um, Prefabrication will be also important. You can see in these pictures um, prefabricated earth, uh, ram earth walls, uh, and this will improve the quality control of the of the final uh, product that we we can uh, apply. Also, what uh, uh, what is also very important would be also the modernization of rehabilitation techniques. Uh, there are uh, already uh, based on experience, on, on accumulative experience, uh, there are already some um, very, very efficient uh, rehabilitation techniques for the, the already constructed um, structures uh, and uh, um, more, um, uh, more um, um, research is needed uh, to develop uh, even more efficient techniques for this rehabilitation to increase the, 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 the durability of the structures, to increase the strength of the structures um, and to um, contribute to preserve 
uh, also the, the cultural heritage that is built with this technique, as you want to show that is uh, that is very important also in in Africa uh, to preserve the cultural heritage, uh, which uh, which will have uh, uh, of course a very great impact for tourism, for for economy, and uh, and so on. So this is will be very important to 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 deepen the the knowledge about these techniques. And 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 uh, finally, uh, to end this presentation, also uh, the the. Um, the, the, the aesthetics and the architectural innovation is it's important so that um, uh, people that want to build their houses and uh, um, uh, architects and owners uh, so that this can be more appealing not only from the uh, um, engineering level from the uh, in economical level from an environmental point of view also, but also in terms of architectural and aesthetic point of view. This is a, an example of a house that was built in the north of Portugal. We were involved in this, in this project. And as you can see, this can, can also um, respond to the, the question of, of uh, having uh, um, also a modern uh, architectural uh, uh, aspect and uh, and uh, design and, and aesthetic. This is a, a house that had an area of 230 square meters, a maximum height of uh, about 6.5 meters, and uh, the walls were made of ramp earth. From uh, the soil that was used was a mixture of a so the soil that existed in this in this area, and the soil that was collected nearby. That was mixed to to get this this color, this texture, and also to have good uh, um, structural uh, and material characteristics. And I leave you with some uh, pictures on, uh, of this of this um, uh, house. I can show you that it is possible to have a very nice environment using this technique, uh, and uh, and you can have a modern house with with uh, aesthetically, functionally, uh, and in terms of durability and comfort using uh, a vernacular approach. Um, so I, I, for the final remarks, I, I, I deliver the ground again to, to Eduardo to, wrap, to make the wrap up. Eduardo, please. Okay, thank you, Tiago. Um, well, I think we already exceeded our time, so very quickly, uh, it is our belief that earth construction is an example and among others that are very grounded on, on the roots of knowledge of local people. And they, this is a very good way to promote sustainable urbanization uh, because it uses local resources, it's low environmental footprints because it's cost effective, but it's accessible. And of course, we need to do this work of capacity building, maybe not not only us, but all, all of us as a society to create all these opportunities uh, for, for good, sustainable and resilient uh, de developments. Uh, also, the preservation and the rehabilitation of cultural her heritage is not only important for a, a cultural perspective, but also because it may be a good uh, source of activity for the people and for resources, for tourism, for, for the economy, uh, the creation of opportunities for new activities to use the creativity to extend all these old construction techniques to develop new approaches that can bring comfort and the desires of, of the new people, the young people, and of course the contribution that all this can be and can give for growth, for the promotion of sustainable infrastructures, creation and for tourism. And with this, uh, I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I think we had some questions, but I hand it to the, the chairman now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Eduardo and Tiago, for this uh, rather extensive presentation covering different aspects of Burton architecture. Indeed, there are many questions or comments. I think one, uh, one common thing to many questions or comments is the kind of, not conflict, but the, the ambiguity between urban architecture on one hand is the, the result of 
skilled craftsmen. So it's individual work to some sense. And on the other end, in some cases, you might wish to go to, uh, let's say, modern construction technique, even to 3D printing, which has already been shown to be feasible with Earth. So uh, what's your position about those two extremes? The, the, the emphasis on the, the skills of the craftsmen or industrialization, robotization, etc. Tiago, do you want to start? Yes. Well, uh, I don't know if we, if we have a, a common opinion about the, the subject, but in my point of view, both approaches are not incompatible because we can have a, a more vernacular and more um, craftsman approach and, uh, and to make to, to, to deliver some kind of response to the problem. And also we, we need the industrialization processes so that uh, the, the growing demand in terms of population, in terms of um, needs to, 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 to have a lot of housing together, this growing demand on, on cities. So we, don't, we, we, cannot, uh, um, we cannot rely only on, on craftsmen and, uh, and this more um, vernacular approach. So I think they are compatible and uh, they are also, I think they are also um, complementary. They don't need to, to annihilate each other. So this is my, my opinion on, on the subject. Yeah, I agree. I think the best is to join both. This is where we may have the best evolution. I think the youngsters will, will, will try to use the high-tech approach. The old men will contribute with their skills and this is the best, to join both and to have new things, of course. Okay, thank you. Then there is another uh, important point. Uh, the codes, regulations. Mm -hmm. Is this really desirable in the sense, again, going back to the first question, uh, craftsmen, individual craftsmen versus industrialized uh, production, uh, are the regulations or the, the plans for regulations adapted to all types of urban constructions? Maybe. Well, you want to, to start this, this one? No, you can, you can go. <laughs> well, there, there are a, a bunch of, of norms and regulations in different countries. You have, uh, for instance, in the United States, in, um, in, uh, in Australia, in Canada, uh, they are all different. And uh, I think an effort for the normalization of uh, international normalization is it's good. Uh, mainly for the second part of what you said, for the industrialization, in this industrialization process processes. Uh -huh. uh, for, for that, I think it's important to have international code so that uh, different design uh, um, engineers can work and you can count on what you are developing to, well, I think, uh, I think it's, it gives you also a, a more um, confidence on the technique, on the, rest, on the rebirth of, the, of uh, this technique uh -huh. uh, so that you can give uh, engineers, contractors, and owners, the confidence that they have when they use another kind of materials like cement, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think it will be important in this, in that context. For insurances also. Yeah, also, yeah, of course. Okay, okay. Uh, let's look if there is something special in the, que in the questions. Um, can you see them? Yeah, I think yes. the, the main discussion right now is exactly on this point. Of course, I also teach architecture and normally the discussion is uh, normalization castrates the thinking uh, and in opposition, if we don't have normalization or technical guidelines, we don't have the security or the safety factors we engineers always love to have so that we have risk control. Uh, the best maybe is to have, again, both. Uh, normalization should, sh should follow a path that opens more the range of possible solutions and safety uh, frames, okay, so that we have more diverse safety approaches. And on the other hand, we can have uh, different um, 
levels of, of safety and normalization for different types of, of earth construction. I think uh, it may become so diverse that we, in a few years or in some years, with all this creativity from uh, the young people from Africa and all, all over the world, to have niche cases where you don't have so much normalization and you have uh, wide or ample application cases where you need normalization because you need reliability and you need to, to reduce risk. This is the, the, the play that has to be to be played or yeah. Okay. Uh, perhaps I could ask a technical question about seismic resistance. Uh, you showed work about adobe walls, but masonry with blocks or adobe bricks is probably not the best solution for seismic resistance. I would guess that uh, other techniques like poured earth or uh, rammed earth are better, best, better suited for seismic resistance. Is that correct? It's a very tough question, <laughs> Eric, because it, it depends on the, on the, the, the soil, it depends on, on uh, the reinforcement that you use, because uh -huh. in, there is there are uh, some already some some reinforcement techniques that you can use in, in when you use masonry. Uh, you can reinforce from the uh, from the inside and the outside with uh, with fibers and uh, um, um, well, you can have you can you can you you must uh, uh, force that the the. Um, the, the the failure if it happens it doesn't ha happen uh, um, in in the out of play direction so you have to install reinforcements in order that uh, yeah. that you 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 force that the seismic failure if it happens it will be in plane and there are several techniques that you can apply and if they if they uh, work and some work shows that uh, it can they can work. Uh, the 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 seismic uh, behavior of uh, masonry earth blocks can be uh, very much enhanced. So, well, it will depend if uh, on the reinforcement technique that you, that you can apply. Okay, thank you. Well, we come to.